Okay, so um, this is a woman that came to us from um, a town outside of Truckee, um, very rural, and um, she was seen by a nurse practitioner and sent for a screening mammogram and came up with a breast cancer. She had a previous history of breast cancer, I think it was 2015, and I don't know where she lived prior, but um, she was... Uh, she had a mastectomy, and um, I think that was her choice as well that time, um, just because she didn't want to have uh, radiation. Anyway, she um, she came to us for the second breast cancer, um, but after her first breast cancer, she was put on aromatase inhibitors, and she just decided to stop, or, you know, she fell out of follow-up. That was the really the big issue for this woman. Um, but anyway, she chose um, again to have um, a mastectomy because she did not want to travel for um, radiation and um, she had transportation difficulties and she had already had a mastectomy. So she was pretty um, decided about, you know, wanting to have another mastectomy. Um, I thought she was interesting in that she's one of those patients that kind of lives out of the area and um, her follow-up is kind of sketchy, um, but um, fortunately she did have a prime, she did see someone and so they discovered this, you know, second breast cancer and um, she had treatment. Um, I don't know that I have any particular questions about this case. I just thought she was kind of interesting um, for one, because it kind of gives an example of the difficulties for people that live um, a distance um, from treatment. And, um, and also that she is a little almost lackadaisical about her follow-up care. She didn't really want to engage a whole lot. Alrighty, great. Thanks, Karen. Any other information you'd want to share with us? Um, I don't know. I've never done a case presentation before. I'm not quite sure um, exactly what you're looking for. Um, All right, no problem, Karen. So I think I'll open it up to the group right now. Um, so your question here on the form was what surgical options are available to this patient? Uh, she's concerned as well about missing work. Um, so hopefully. Oh, you know what? Yeah. That is incorrect. Okay. Because I was thinking of another case at the time and then I just went back to this one. So that was a different patient. <laughs> okay. No problem. So anything that we can help you with, uh, with this patient, you said the uh, um, compliance issues potentially? What's that? So what was the, kind of your main question about this case? Uh, well, how do you get someone engaged um, that, you know, really doesn't, you know, want to, they just want to have surgery and move on? And what, how do you handle their survivorship? I mean, to me, I feel like in her case, um, her primary care, which, you know, uh, is the nurse practitioner out where she lives, is like really um, critical in um, you know, making sure she gets the right follow-up because I'm not really sure that she'll come back for follow-up here. Excellent, all right. Well, thank you, Karen. Great uh, case presentation for us here today. So I'll open it up um, kind of in the interest of time. I think we'll just kind of do everybody, including the hub team right now uh, for clarifying questions. So this is kind of your opportunity to, to ask Karen a little bit more about this case uh, to help your, yourself understand it a little bit more. So any clarifying questions or any more information you all would like to know? <laughs> if you do, please feel free to unmute yourselves with the microphone icon on the Zoom toolbar or the chat box. Go ahead, Dr. Reynosa. Um, my first question would be whether she used an, as, uh, used an external prosthesis um, or whether she's been offered that during this entire time. 
Um, you know, I'm not sure. I'm honestly not sure. And Dr. Goldman? I think, I think the question's a, a really kind of a, comp, a more complex one than it seems to be than ostensibly. I mean, if you, if you really think about it, I, I think we spend a lot of time, you know, explaining risks and benefits of, of treatment options, right? And um, I think from a you know, chemotherapy and surgical standpoint, there's multiple options and, and a lot of moving parts to treatment and patient motivation becomes a significant factor, right? And uh, it sounds like, you know, part of your, your question is how do you motivate during survivorship? And uh, I, I've, I've run into this in my own practice. We were talking about this yesterday. Um, a few of the patients that I've seen um, that are on the younger side um, have decided not to continue on with tamoxifen, which is where a lot of the research has, has been um, with patients that are compliant with, uh, you know, longer term tamoxifen treatment, um, post-surgery or, or post-treatment. And so, um, you know, I think all you can really do is, is offer the information, right? And that's kind of the, the stance that I've took is, to try to inform the patient as much as I possibly can of all of their options um, from a treatment and from a reconstructive side um, to make sure that they have all of that information and then you know they can you know hopefully hopefully do the best they can with that information um, and I think you know part of it too is it's it's all joint decision making right so it's all kind of understanding their long term goals expectations and desires um, and working that into the information that you give them um, which again it, it becomes extremely complex but. Um, it doesn't seem to be because we, we think of it as, you know, there's an option for radiation, an option for surgery, and an option for, uh, you know, medical oncologic treatment, right? Um, that's only three things. But when you start thinking about the permutations of those three things, the timing, and then you bring in the options for reconstruction and longitudinal care, um, it, it becomes more and more complex. And so I definitely, I definitely see your point. And I've seen that more and more in my, my practice, this, um, this issue of motivation and kind of, kind of uh, I think, what you could easily call like cancer treatment fatigue um, and uh, just kind of throwing in the towel and saying, Oh, I've done enough. Um, so I think, but all you can do really to combat that is, is uh, give them the hope of other patients that have been successful and to give them all of the information uh, on the, the available options. I think, I think I can echo with others um, in, in my practice when we start off the discussion of, uh, you know, breast cancer, breast cancer treatments, um, it is a very complex journey. And the question is, how do you lay the roadmap out and how you get that multidisciplinary approach um, to so that they get the benefit of seeing all the specialities just to understand. And I think the first two, three consultations will just go in helping them understand what they're getting into. Uh, if you look at the compliance of, um, you know, hormonal anti-estrogen hormonal therapy, it traditionally, all the studies across board is about 60 to 70 percent. So, and I think 60 percent is also high if you could really go through the number. And giving that prolonged anti-estrogen therapy um, helps that you capture most of them at least taking some part of the treatment over the the five years. But nowadays, we also use a lot of genomic profiling. We also use a lot of uh, genetic testing, and you know, kind of reinforce that what your risk benefit is. Like simple thing like oncotype recurrence score. When I show them the reports and I say, hey, in 10 years, this is where your plot looks like you're in the low risk intermediate. And that, again, reinforces their compliance too, especially for those high risk patients. Mm -hmm. So, and Karen, you know, um, yeah, I will um, echo what everybody said in regards to um, making sure you get everybody the information uh, as much as possible. But um, one of the reasons in, in regards to asking about the external processes uh, is because in particular for patients that decide not to have any kind of reconstruction at all, you know, they know what it feels like to be completely flat. They don't have an idea of what it's like, you know, if they have a reconstruction. And an external prosthesis can kind of give them the idea of that without surgery, okay? So that would be kind of the first step I, I would kind of think about um, uh, suggesting if they haven't had that before. And then if somebody has recommended that to them, then and they're not using it the question would be why you know is it too heavy does it cause discomfort is there other reasons why they're not using an external prosthesis and things like that um, and once you figure out those things you know um, you can kind of um, move forward with saying okay is this external prosthesis or this feeling that you get when you're in clothes something that you would like um, to have more long term without you know the taking on taking off and you know those kinds of things and then you can kind of discuss with them you know the pros and cons of um, tissue expanders and implants versus 
you know, um, using your own tissue. One is going to be more time in the hospital, but, you know, less follow up and other stuff later on, which it sounds like she's not the greatest at follow up. So tissue expanders and implants, you know, isn't going to be the best thing for her. Additionally, she's a smoker. So, you know, um, yeah, totally. is, yeah. So, I mean, you know, if she hasn't even had a, a, the option for having external prosthesis and doesn't even know what kind of the differences are going to be like in clothes, like how she feels and stuff like that. You know, you're never going to motiv motivate her to quit smoking if you don't give her like, you know, the idea of what she can, you know, achieve with surgery. Mm -hmm. Karen, I would also um, consider talking to the nurse practitioner that follows her so that mm -hmm. if she's not following up at Tahoe Forest, uh, at least the nurse practitioner knows what to look for as far as signs of recurrence of her cancer. Um, not all primary cares understand how to examine the chest wall, what you're looking for on the chest wall. So again, educating those that are involved in the care of the patient outside of Tahoe Forest would be important as well. And talking to the patient about what she should be doing exam wise, what is not normal to have on the chest wall. And, and to that point as well, I, I think it's, it's really important. Um, I don't know how sophisticated this patient is, but to a lot of patients, it doesn't make sense that you can still have breast cancer after your breasts have been removed. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that has yeah, a lot to do, true. With, to do with a major motivation. Issue. <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, I think that has a lot to do with motivation or motivating long-term treatment um, when they, they feel like they've already gotten rid of the, the source of the problem. Um, and so I think that, you know, understanding that from the patient standpoint or the layperson standpoint is also, you know, kind of of extreme importance. Um, and then I think, you know, to kind of echo Dr. Benoz's point, um, you, have, you have that side of it, which is a, a treatment issue, um, understanding the long-term need for treatment. And then you have the, the psychological aspect of it um, where, you know, we, we know, we've well delineated that there is, um, you know, psychological distress that comes from not having breasts in a large portion of patients. And so um, some people can lose hope from that as well. And that can also you know, lead to that kind of fatigue. Um, and so I think you really have to treat this from both the, the cancer treatment standpoint and that quality of life standpoint that we kind of harp on. You know, that reemphasizes why we need to have this multidisciplinary approach for management of this cancer, because I think seeing all those specialists in the care helps a lot, especially to reinforce our ideas and get a comprehensive plan. And, you know, I think, I think every patient who's, who's looking at surgery should see all the, um, you know, both the plastics and the general sur the breast surgeons and then oncologists, radiation oncologists, just to get that perspective of how we're going to build the program for them. Um, the, I also see uh, issues related to, you know, financial barriers and, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the racial barriers of how, how you can get those patients cross that line and that border to get to the other specialists. So that has also been a major part of the, you know, because we are the first ones who are seeing these patients most often and, <clears throat> and getting Well, that fortunately in this, at, at our center, we're very fortunate in that um, we really push push that approach and um, of the multidisciplinary team. And part of my role as the nurse navigator is to get patients set up for um, their three appointments all within a very short time frame. Um, and for patients that come from far away, we often do the medical and the radiation oncology um, appointment at, on the same day to try and get them in for that. I think that the financial barrier is also a huge hurdle um, or obstacle that you know we see as a, as a barrier to care. I mean, I think I was pretty naive during my training. You know, I used to say insurance covers breast reconstruction. And you know, yeah. in my mind, that meant it was free, right? Um, but you know, as we see towards the end of the year, every single patient wants to get in um, in December because all of their deductibles have been met. And if they have to go in January, then they have to pay a huge sum of money up front um, for their out of pocket until they meet their out of pocket again. <clears throat> so, I mean, I think that that's a, that's a, that's a huge point that, um, you know, I, I don't think that we're, we're particularly well trained in, um, understanding and, and conveying to the patients. I think, um, there's some good data that, um, and some data some, by some of my colleagues that's coming out showing that really the, the cost of types of breast reconstruction doesn't differ. So, you know, if Dr. Benosa and I offer, you know, a deep flap, which is on the more complex, uh, end of the spectrum, actually the long-term costs end up being the same to the patient specifically um, and their out-of-pocket costs. 
but that doesn't mean that they're free. <laughs> and so it still remains a significant barrier to care. And so I think you know, that's something I've tried to be more attuned to as well. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure of the right answer for that one, but I think, you know, as, as the, uh, wh whether you're, um, what, regardless of what political side of the spectrum you're on, um, if we, if the Affordable Care Act goes away, we're gonna have to be even more um, attuned to that um, as, as patients lose insurance. And then, you know, with COVID, you know, I've had a lot of patients who lost their jobs um, and lost their insurance as well. And so, um, you know, COBRA is not cheap. And I think a lot of patients have struggled it, with it from that side as well. Um, and I know there's a lot of, of good state programs to help fund, um, you know, Medicare, Medicaid options for specifically for cancer patients. Um, but that's something that we've had to be, you know, more, more apt um, to understand and, and work with the patients on. All right, well, this has been a really great discussion about this case, Karen. Uh, anything else we can help you with here today? Um, well, I'm thinking of another patient and she might have been um, a good one to discuss in terms of the whole plastic surgery thing, but um, this woman has um, implants and she has a breast cancer and she has actually two areas and I um, and our surgeon um, and because we don't have plastic surgery is referring her outside to uh, for another opinion where she would have plastic surgery involved because she's not sure what the outcome would be if she tried to do two, uh, two lumpectomies um, with implants in place. That would have been an interesting one, but I don't have all the details on that. Uh, yeah, Karen, um, would you be maybe interested in presenting that later in the series? Sure. Okay, we, yeah, we've still got- Because I'm really curious to see how, what, what options she has, because it's not, you know, straightforward. Absolutely, yeah, we've got two sessions still left in this series on uh, November 7th. So I can try and get all the details and then bring yeah. her up. Yeah, so we've got some time left still. Yeah, I would love to hear that one from you, Karen, and, and be able to discuss that here with the big group. Alrighty, well, thank you so much for presenting. I really love the discussion and, and the ability to discuss that case with you. So thank you. Alrighty, so now we'll shift gears. We'll move over uh, to Dr. Schuff and her presentation for us here today. Always uh, throughout the didactic portion of these ECHO sessions, Please feel free to, to interrupt, unmute yourself, or you can always write in through the chat box if you have any questions or comments or there's anything else that you'd like to discuss regarding uh, the didactic. So I will turn it over to Dr. Schaff. Thank you. Again, I'm uh, Dr. Jamie Schaff. I'm a radiation oncologist in Reno, and I also work with Karen at Tahoe Forest as well. Um, so I I've been asked to speak about radiation toxicity. So today I would like to just go over the basics of radiation, a review the acute, subacute, and late toxicities. We have a couple plastic surgeons on board and they just love patients who've had radiation and our late toxicities. <laughs> and then how we manage those toxicities. So as far as the history of radiation, x-rays were actually discovered in 1895 by Wilhelm Röntgen. So they've been around for a long time. And then radium was discovered the following year by Madame Curie. So she's the most famous of them all. Uh, they initially used gas tubes filled with radium to treat skin cancers. And the next slide. Um, this is an x-ray that William Röntgen actually took of his wife's hand in 1895. So it's pretty impressive for the 1800s. Next. And these are the radium gas tubes. They look very uh, barbaric. On the next picture, you can see how they actually used to tape these radium tubes onto skin cancers to get these skin cancers to melt away. Uh, radium gas tubes were used to treat breast cancers as well. Madame Curie noticed that when she taped a radium gas tube onto a breast that the tumor actually shrank. The problem with these radium gas tubes is that the radiation was very unpredictable. So they had to come up with a better way of managing radiation. So on the next slide, 
you can see the kilovoltage tube or a, a version of orca voltage tube where you have these filaments on this tube that created kilovoltage radiation. And with these tubes, they could actually insert them into the cavity of a breast or a head and neck cancer patient to treat these various cancers. Next slide. And those weren't very high energy. So then they worked on creating higher energy and uh, radiation tubes um, with 200 kilovolts and higher so that they could treat the deeper tumors in the lung, abdomen, pelvis, as well as the larynx. And in the early 1900s, they were curing laryngeal cancer with radiation. Also in the 1920s, um, they started doing a different form of brachytherapy or internal radiation with radium needles that were inserted into the, the cancers. Then they developed the cobalt machine, which is a way of giving gamma radiation. So this is one of the first cobalt machines. This is where a lot of radiation gets a bad rap. If you hear about you know, patients saying, well, my great aunt had radiation and it blew a hole in her chest. It, Probably had, she probably had horrible toxicities from a cobalt machine because of the way the gamma rays travel. Uh, they got a lot of surface toxicity. So uh, the big areas of uh, redness of the skin and ulceration were from cobalt machines. Next slide. And then in 1953, Dr. Henry Kaplan, who's at Stanford, he developed the linear accelerator. And this was actually a really big change, uh, landmark change in the field of radiation oncology. And it allowed us to cure Hodgkin's lymphomas as well as testicular cancers with far bar, uh, better toxicity profile. This is the first linear accelerator. So this little boy had retinoblastoma. He actually had bilateral retinoblastoma. So he had enucleation on one side and developed a retinoblast, uh, retinoblastoma in his intact eye. And this linear accelerator was used to treat it. And he's a very well-behaved little boy just sitting there. My kids wouldn't do that. Um, this is a grown man being immobilized. This is their way of immobilizing patients with this very large linear accelerator. And this is a more modern uh, linear accelerator that's used to date. So as far as radiobiology, um, radiation that we use is ionizing radiation because we use form, uh, radiation like x-rays. So uh, it deposits energy as they transverse the median and it creates secondary charged particles that produce further ionizing changes. So these free radicals cause DNA damage, which can either cause immediate cell death or a delayed cell death. When we look at radiation, we're always considering the therapeutic rate, uh, ratio. So how much radiation do we need to deliver to eradicate a cancer, but we also have to manage the side effect profile that uh, we have for radiation as well. So as far as the radiobiology, again, we cause normal tissue complications from the, the cell kill. So some tissues respond by creating a hyperproliferation of fibroblasts, which results in collagen deposition, and this ultimately uh, results in fibrosis. And then the radiosensitivity of the target cells determines the severity of the earlier late effect in normal tissues, as well as the timing of when we see the side effect profile. So radiation toxicities, again, are divided into acute, subacute, and late toxicity. And the toxicities that we see depends on how the radiation is given, whether we're giving hyperfractionation, so multiple fractions in a shorter period of time, hypofractionation, high doses of radiation over a shorter period of time, and then conventional fractionations where you hear people getting radiation for several weeks. LDR and HDR, those are brachytherapy techniques. So low dose uh, radiation and high dose radiation. So again, radiation toxicities depend on the area being treated with the exception being fatigue. Everybody gets fatigue regardless of what site that we treat. So with skin, this is considered an early responding tissue. So the acute side effects for skin start early. It starts at the end of the second week or early in the third week of radiation. 
and we see erythema of the skin. We can see dry desquamation, which we usually treat with a non-fragrance lotion. The fragrance lotions dry out the skin even more, so we avoid those, as well as moist desquamation. So moist desquamation, we treat with aquaphor or sylvadine, seraphone gauze, or Domboro soaks. Usually these skin changes resolve within two to four weeks after the completion of treatment. So, um, D, E, and F, more like E and F, those are extreme <laughs> examples of radiation toxicities of the skin um, that we can get. Most often times we see B, C, and D uh, with radiation. E and F, um, sometimes we intentionally do that to the skin now if it's a skin cancer, if somebody has inflammatory breast cancer, so the cancer is involving the skin we want the skin to get really toasty. We want it to blister. So uh, this is, these are all examples of radiation dermatitis. So subacute, again, this redness of the skin can fade into a normal skin color or it fades into a tan. And that tan can take several weeks to months to go away. In the next slide. Um, if that tanning is still present at one year, then it is permanent. Um, the risk of having, having permanent tanning of the skin is usually about 10 to 15%. We can also get soft tissue fibrosis, so patients can develop like a woody texture of the skin or thickening of the breast would be an example. Um, sometimes this soft tissue fibrosis can cause decreased range of motion. So the moist and dry desquamation occurs from depletion of the basal cells of the epidermis. The fibrosis results from damage of the dermal fibroblasts. And then we can also get telangiectasias that form on the skin as well from damage to the small blood vessels. When we treat the brain, we cause hair loss. If we treat the whole brain, they lose all of the hair on their head. If we do serotactic radiosurgery or partial brain radiation, they can just have patchy hair loss. We can cause redness and itchiness of the scalp. Um, the most problematic is swelling around the tumors from radiation, and we, off, uh, we often combat that with the use of Decadron. Patients get really fatigued whenever we treat the brain. Again, all these side effects usually resolve within a couple of weeks. Long-term side effects when we treat the brain, permanent hair loss. This really depends on the location of the tumor that we're treating and the dose of radiation that's getting to the scalp. Um, neurocognitive dysfunction is a possible toxicity that can happen years down the road. The greatest risk of that is if we're treating the whole brain and patients already have uh, vascular disease, like uh, they've had multiple strokes or they have uh, underlying diabetes. And then radiation necrosis can happen as well. Oftentimes this can be asymptomatic. If it's symptomatic, we treat it with Decadron. There's other drugs that we can use as well. Rarely, patients require surgery to remove the areas of radiation necrosis. When we treat head and neck, these side effects are honestly the worst. Um, they get erythema in the skin, dry, moist desquamation. They can have hair loss in the treatment region. The most bothersome uh, and most concerning sites or toxicities are the mucositis. So they actually get blisters in their mouth and, mouth and throat, xerostomia, so they have the dryness as well. And it's not just simple dryness where they just, they take a sip of water and it goes away. Their saliva gets really thickened and they have trouble clearing the saliva. Discusia, which is decreased taste or loss of taste and fatigue. Next slide. So again, xerostomia, mucositis, and then discusia are the most challenging. It can lead to profound weight loss and dehydration. So a lot of times our head and neck cancer patients will get feeding tubes ahead of time or have to get feeding tubes during the course of treatment. They don't sleep well because of, again, the mucositis is very painful, the xerostomia causes those thickened secretions, which can lead to patients feeling like they're gagging on their secretions at night. Next slide. So for the xerostomia, we tell patients to sleep with a humidifier, but it has to be right next to their head to have a humidifier work. They sip water throughout the day and night. There are art artificial saliva products, um, which only work while the product is in your mouth and then it no longer works. I usually have my patients sleep with the head of their bed elevated and they can always try mucinex as well. But this is a very difficult side effect to manage. Mucositis, so the blisters in the mouth and the throat. We have magic mouthwash, MBX, which have numbing, has uh, viscous lidocaine in it. 
pain medications, again, feeding tube versus high calorie shakes. Long-term side effects, soft tissue fibrosis in the neck, which can cause decreased range of motion. So we have physical therapists involved. They can get submental edema from uh, alteration of the lymphatic drainage. Permanent hair loss, again, this is mostly facial hair. Decreased thyroid function, that happens in about 20 to 30% of patients. And about 20% of patients can have permanent swallowing dysfunction. This is typically in the patients who presented with tumors that already were impacting swallowing. Um, xerostomia can lead to long-term dental problems, so it's important to have dentists involved in their care. Um, they will always have some degree of decreased taste, and there's a possibility of esophageal stricture. Breast, acute side effects, fatigue, um, edema of the breast, erythema of the skin, and moist and dried esquamation. Next slide. Long-term side effects, again, there's a risk of permanent hyperpigmentation. We can see thickening of the breast tissues as well as uh, chest wall fibrosis. You can have decreased range of motion on that ipsilateral, ipsilateral upper extremity. You have an increased risk of lymphedema depending on uh, the surgery they had prior to radiation. It's really rare to have cardiac toxicity, rib fracture, or radiation pneumonitis. With thoracic treatments, again, erythema, the skin in the treatment region, we can cause esophagitis, which is just blistering of the esophagus, which can cause weight loss, dehydration. They require high caloric shakes, sometimes feeding tubes, um, pain medications. We can cause dry cough, shortness of the breath, and fatigue. So this is an example of radiation esophagitis. Um, we know the blisters happen. We actually prefer that nobody scopes a patient when they have radiation esophagitis. We don't want to risk um, um, them actually causing a fistula in the esophagus or, or a puncture in the esophagus during the procedure. Radiation pneumonitis is a subacute side effect that can actually happen two to four months after the completion of radiation. It really depends on the volume of lung that's treated. It presents with shortness of breath and cough. Typically, we manage it with steroids and supplemental oxygen. Next slide. So this is a, a case of severe radiation pneumonitis. So oftentimes, if a patient has CT scan and they've had prior radiation, radi radiologists will say there's evidence of radiation pneumonitis or radiation pneumonia. That's just radiation changes that you see on, in the lungs. Um, typically, for it to really be called a radiation pneumonitis, all this inflammation has to line up with how the radiation came in, and the patients are symptomatic of it. If they're not, not symptomatic, we don't do anything about it. If they're symptomatic, that's when we have to start steroids. So long-term side effects of thoracic radiation, again, scarring of the lung, this rarely causes a decrease in pulmonary function. We can cause esophageal fibrosis, which can lead to stricture formation and rarely uh, fistula formation. You can have chest wall pain depending on the rib dose and spinal myelopathy, which is really rare. When we treat the abdomen, again, erythema of the skin, um, we can cause nausea and vomiting, which is managed with antiemetics, abdominal cramping, which is managed with emodium and lamotal. Same with the diarrhea and loose stools, again, emodium and lamotal, as well as a low residue diet. Long-term toxicities of, of abdominal radiation or small bowel obstruction. The risk of a small bowel obstruction really is determined uh, or based upon how many um, abdominal surgeons or surgeries or pelvic surgeries the patient has had before. If they've had multiple abdominal surgeries or multiple pelvic surgeries, they're already at high risk for small bowel obstruction and we increase this risk even further. Um, it's rare but possible to have necrosis or fistula formation uh, between the bowels and then a permanent increased frequency of bowel movements, stomach ulceration, and rarely liver or renal impairment. With treatment of the pelvis, the acute side effects include moist and dried esquamation in the gluteal cleft, perineum, perianal, and vulvar region. Again, it just depends on what we're actually treating. We manage this um, if, like, if it's a vulvar patient or an anal cancer patient, we uh, will definitely see ulceration or moist esquamation of those tissues. So we treat them with Domboro soaks, Aquaphor, Silvidine, if there's not an allergy, lidocaine, jelly, as well as um, 
as spritz bottles that they can spritz themselves while using the restroom. They'll have pubic hair loss, loose stools, abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, and increased urination. Long-term side effects, again, that risk of small bowel obstruction, permanent increased frequency of bowel movements, bleeding from the rectum or bladder, pelvic insufficiency fractures, infertility is the biggest one. So we can cause menopause in young women. The ovaries are very sensitive to radiation. Um, in men, it just depends on whether or not the testes are irradiated at the same time. And then vaginal stenosis, we use vaginal dilators uh, for the patients. Uh, they do this on their own a couple times a week, and it's lifelong that they have to use these to help decrease the risk of narrowing in the vaginal canal. Skeletal acute and long-term toxicity. So acute toxicities, we can decrease the blood count. So whenever we do radiation at the same time as, ke as chemotherapy, we have to watch the counts carefully. Um, Long-term toxicities, again, permanent decrease in the blood counts, decreased range of motion whenever we treat a joint. So radiation toxicities, really the side effects depend on the area that we're treating. Everyone reacts differently as far as the intensity and severity of the toxicity. And all of these side effects are intensified by the use of concurrent chemotherapy. And that's it. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Shuff. So yeah, we'll open it up right now uh, for questions from the group. Dr. Shaf, uh, when we give chemotherapy and explain the benefits of chemotherapy, we usually also follow it up with a chemo class. Do you know, guys normally use that you know, before starting radiation? Each center is different as far as what they offer patients to discuss radiation and toxicity. Some places have videos that they show the patients, which is really helpful, or they have videos and pamphlets that are site-specific. Um, to help address these questions as well. Thanks for your question, Dr. Thumala. Any other questions or comments from the group? I'm just going to throw out a plug. Most of you guys know this already, but just really the importance here in all of this of referring your patients to an actual trained and qualified either physical therapist or cancer exercise specialist. Um, it's great if your patients want to get back into the gym and work out with a trainer they've always worked out with, and the goal would be to get them back to that. Um, but these side effects are not taught during a regular personal training certification. Um, so knowing when to not stretch and when to start stretching again during radiation with the skin blisters and stuff, um, that really takes advanced qualifications. So um, just be aware of that if your patients are still wanting to work out, um, make sure they at least have a consult with a physical therapist or a cancer exercise specialist. That is a great point. So Cassie works with us for years. We um, created a cancer rehab program. So we actually have an exercise program that is geared for all of our cancer patients who've been through chemo or chemo and radiation. Sometimes our patients go through physical therapy first. They have to be cleared from the physical therapy portion of things before they go into the exercise portion of the program. And then they work carefully with uh, special physical uh, trainers or uh, exercise specialists. Um, <laughs> who help with our patients and the proper exercises that are geared for them. And patients love this program. So if we could recreate programs like this all over, it would be fantastic. It's helped with our patients as far as lymphedema management, um, getting active, losing weight, as a lot of patients, our breast cancer patients specifically will gain a lot of weight during their treatment. Um, we also have a lot of lymphedema certified physical therapists um, to help with this. Um, it's important to get patients into pelvic rehab so that if they have incontinence issues and that's what's preventing them from being active, um, we can address that prior to starting their exercise program. Yeah. And a uh, speech and language pathologist when it comes yeah. to the swallowing issues. Um, I'll hear a lot of patients say, well, I don't have a speech problem. I'm like, well, <laughs> it's 
just because that's their title doesn't mean it's the only thing they do. Um, they will work with the swallowing complications. <laughs> great talk and, and great point about the um, rehab. That's you know something I think that needs some developing here in Las Vegas. But um, do you, do you have do you discuss the long term complications of radiated patients with regard to implants? or um, breast conserving su surgery, um, asymmetries and things like that. Because I think that that's, that's something that I end up spending a lot of time um, discussing with the patients and especially a lot of time with patients that don't know if they're going to have radiation or not. Um, so we end up kind of talking in hypothetical circles um, for, for a bit of our consultations. But um, you know, I think the, the understanding, even from the breast surgeon standpoint, um, is, is a little bit lacking. And I'm sure you see the long-term complications of uh, you know the patient that didn't have a mastectomy and had a lumpectomy plus radiation um, and has some sort of asymmetry and now they don't qualify for the Women's Health Care Rights Act um, so insurance isn't, isn't mandated to cover their um, reconstruction or to fix those asymmetries. Um, I always tell them that the, ra the radiated breast looks younger um, and if I, could, if I could figure out how to do that without any complications I'd be a very wealthy physician but um, the, the reality is you know that then they don't have to have the mastopexy on the contralateral side paid for by insurance. Um, and then of course, you know, if they have implants, they have you know, from, from our literature, you know, a huge increase, exponential increase in complications with regard to implant loss over time, expander loss uh, during their reconstructions um, and long-term or early capsular contracture. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of the patients and the breast surgeons don't, don't see that necessarily. Um, and so I was wondering if you, if you, if you have any discussion with the patients with regard to those aspects. I, I do. I speak with them a lot about it. I, I prefer to see patients before they even have uh, mastectomies. That way they understand really what life is going to be like after, after a mastectomy with or without reconstruction. I feel like a lot of times they are not told that they're going to have a numb chest wall. And that is a very bothersome long-term issue for these women. I talk about the timing of reconstruction after radiation, if they have a tissue expander in versus implant and I irradiate it, when they can have surgery. If these women have tissue expanders put in place and they've gone through chemotherapy and then they have to go through radiation and wait at least six to 12 months before they have that expander swapped out for an implant, this is a very long time to feel like you have a cement block on your chest wall yeah. from that expander. So a lot of times I'll try to coordinate with a plastic surgeon after the time after chemotherapy to see if we could swap out that expander for an implant. At least it's more comfortable for the patient. And then I always tell them I'm going to ruin the implant. So just know that you're going to have to have further reconstructive surgery at some point down the road. Um, if they ha if they have not had uh, a mastectomy, there's no implant involved. I um, do talk to them about the asymmetry that they're going to have just from having the cancer removed in their breast conservation surgery. I think a lot of times patients come out from that surgery, they're still swollen or they have a nice big seroma in their breast. So they don't really realize how asymmetric their breasts are, are at that point. Um, and then once the radiation is done, the seroma has been absorbed and then they see this big divot in their breasts. They're very um, concerned about how the appearance of their breast is. Um, so I think overall there's a lack of communication or patient actually remembering what has been told to them by all their care providers. So the breast surgeon, the plastic surgeon, the chemo doc, or myself, we will tell them the toxicities of their treatment, but they're so overwhelmed with their cancer diagnosis, they don't remember. So it's important to keep repeating all of this this information during the course of their treatment and afterwards so they know what, that what they're going through is normal and expected and then have the resources available so that we can refer them to plastics or whomever to help deal with their their cosmetic issues um, and another area that i think is really um goes there's very little attention and cassie and amy helped me with this last year is the sexual health implications of cancer treatment. So um, a year ago, over a year ago, we had a sexual health seminar that we hosted here in Reno. And it was fantastic. We, um, we brought in a, a sexual health expert from Stanford. We brought in physical therapists that specialize in pelvic floor rehab. Um, again, lots of different specialists talk about um, the implications of women's cancer treatment and how the long, how it has a long-term effect on their sexual health. So again, 
um, people who have had a mastectomy and they don't realize they're going to have a numb chest wall and how much this impacts their sexual health, or they've had pelvic irradiation and they have the dryness of the tissues are narrow, narrowing and they are no longer able to be sexually inter active because nobody has helped them heal or do the proper interventions to help maintain the health of their tissues. We do, uh, we, we are, uh, we've authorized a couple of, um, this for, for sense, uh, sensate, uh, breast reconstruction. So we do do, uh, you know, re um, free flaps. Um, again, I don't think, you know, it's not, it's obviously not normal skin mm -hmm. sensation and it's definitely not erogenous sensation, but, um, you know, it does give some proprioceptive feeling that I think adds a lot. And, and some early studies have shown an increase in patient satisfaction from that. So I think, I think your point about no, that numbness and, and patients not knowing that is, is definitely something I see all the time. I think the, the question that I kind of search out in the literature really is, is the question that I get most commonly. And that's, you know, the patient who is a good candidate for either breast conserving surgery, so lumpectomy plus radiation, or a mastectomy plus reconstruction, you know, kind of what is the, uh, without radiation, what is the long-term satisfaction? And I think that's something that the, the literature hasn't really borne out perfectly yet. Um, you know, most papers show some equivalence between the two groups. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, like, like you said, we, 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 we see bad radiation all the time. So obviously we're a bit biased um, and it's a life-saving therapy. But I always, you know, I basically tell the patients, you know, the, the risks of, especially with implant-based reconstruction, I essentially don't, I mean, I do expanders in patients who are going to be irradiated. Um, but I, I don't usually, um, I usually try to end that with some sort of autologous reconstruction, um, knowing the long-term complications of a, a, a radiated implant. Uh -huh. uh, and I think that, you know, there's been some study out of, out of Sloan Kettering actually just came out. I think it's a very, it got published because it was out of Sloan Kettering. It wasn't a very well done study, but it had big numbers. Um, but they showed stable reconstructions over time, um, that was some improvement, but they essentially, uh, excluded all complications so obviously then you get pretty good pretty good outcomes but they didn't do it against patients that were reconstructed with autologous tissue which i think is a, a major mm -hmm. flaw of that, of that study and there's really not any i haven't really found any data and maybe it, there's there's stuff in the literature from your, your guys side point from your side but there's really nothing that shows that um an irradiated patient implant-based reconstruction would be uh, you know optimal and so I've never seen anything that showed that. And I think it, it always kind of boggles my mind that, that alloplastic remains the most common, even in the radiated settings, um, no, given that information. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, think that that's, I think that's where kind of some of these disconnects, I'm really glad we're having these like multidisciplinary discussions because I think those disconnects exist. And, and you know, it's good to hear that you do have those conversations uh, with patients. I'm not sure that everybody, everybody does. Yeah. Yeah, um, I would echo what Dr. Goldman said. A great talk, Dr. Schaff. Um, And you know, obviously, we had heard about all the different types of uh, potential complications and way to treat them. You also mentioned um, esophagitis. We talked about swallowing difficulties and, and things. Um, the question I had for you is whether um, you um, have used or refer your patients uh, for hyperbaric oxygen therapies to try to reverse some, uh, in particular, mucosal issues, sometimes wound healing issues, and things like that. There's some good literature also that supports um, the use of hyperbaric therapy to treat some of those um, types of um, complications long-term? We, um, so sometimes we refer patients, we have to be very carefully, we have to be very careful about hyperbaric oxygen because there's always the risk of causing a flare and a cancer recurrence. So if, if there's any concern about residual cancer or uh, in a patient, and you put, send them for hyperbaric oxygen, it can just take off like wildfire. So usually it has to be somebody where we are pretty certain that there's no evidence of recurrence whatsoever. Again, you weigh the risks and benefits of proceeding with hyperbaric. I haven't had to send anybody for hyperbaric in a really long time, honestly. I think it's been since residency when we used to see a lot more issues with osteoradionecrosis in our head and neck patients, typically it was in our elderly VA patients where they had poor dentition and there wasn't any time to pull the teeth ahead of radiation because their cancers were so bad. And we'd see horrible cases of osteoradionecrosis. And um, once we were certain there was no evidence of cancer, they'd have to go to hyperbaric oxygen. But um, I guess we've been very fortunate with our practice that um, 
but we haven't had to send anybody. Uh, but it is something we, we know about it. It's something we think about. We just are very cautious. We, we always talk to the patients about hyperbaric oxygen um, just because we want them to remember to call us to make sure that they're in a safe place to be able to go for it. Great. And then with the, you know, you mentioned that it can kind of just uh, take off like wildfire. I know there have been other studies that show that, you know, um, that isn't necessarily the case. Is that something that you've seen in your experience or is that anecdotal or is that, I mean, is there data to support that? Yeah, it's definitely something we've seen. Uh, we actually saw uh, it happen quite a few times in our patients that, uh, in residency that we sent off for hyperbaric oxygen. Um, I can't, I just, we, I don't, I don't have any recent stories of it, but we have seen it. Um, yeah, it's been a while. All right, any last thoughts or questions from the group? Alrighty, I think we are at time, so we'll go ahead and wrap up for today.